morning. Our first presentation is Working Towards Improving the Efficiency of Natural Dye Sensitized Solar Cells. And our presenter this morning is Caitlin Bamey from the University of Indianapolis, Grow Chapter. Thank you for Thank you for your introduction. It has been cited in the literature that between the years 2008 and 2035, the global energy demand will increase by 2.2% per year. And it is believed by many scientists that non-renewable energy resources will be unable to sustain this growing energy demand. So scientists have been looking for new ways of using, utilizing energy in renewable energy resources. Solar energy is one resource that scientists believe could make a major difference in meeting that energy gap. And one facet of solar energy that is uh, currently being pursued is the use of natural dye-sensitized solar cells, which is what I focused my research on. Today I'll be giving you a quick introduction into dye-sensitized solar cells, also called DSSCs. Uh, the assembly method that I have used, the variables that I've tested, a new instrument that has been created for this research, and then go over some experimental results that I've obtained. So first, the, so the cell assembly is a, a fabrication method that is used. So you start with a layer of transparent conductive glass, and you fabricate that with a titanium dioxide nanoparticle layer. After that dries, you dye it, you sensitize it with a dye, and then you affix a gasket to the conductive glass, fill the well created with an electrolyte, and then use a piece of carbon-coated conductive glass as the counter-electrode. You put them together, and then use force to seal it. I use binder clips in my research, and thus you have a completed solar cell. The way that these solar cells work is that the solar radiation comes in, it passes through the transparent glass, and excites a an electron in the dye, which can be seen here in red. This electron gets excited from the highest occupied molecular orbital, or its ground state, up to its lowest unoccupied molecular orbital, or its excited state. As this electron tries to fall back down into its ground state, it is instead shuttled through the nanoparticle layer to the conductive glass. This electron then moves through a wire connected to the glass, and either to a light source that it can light up, or the instrument you're using to detect the signal through another wire back to the counter electrode, where it then passes through the carbon coating into, a, uh, into an electrolyte that uses an oxidation reduction reaction to replenish that electron originally lost from the dye. So to show you some pictures of the cells that I create, this is the conductive glass coated with the titanium dioxide layer. This is the carbon coated counter electrode. And this is a picture of two fully assembled cells uh, on top is the uh, electrode, and on bottom is the counter electrode. And so you hook these cells into the instrument, and you can then test uh, your cell. So there was many facets of this project that I have gone through. Last year, I gave a presentation on the gasket and the glass. To give a quick summary of that, I tested two types of gaskets and decided to go with a thicker, Garlock fiber gasket, which allowed for longer longevity of the cells, as well as an easier fabrication process. And I tested two types of glass. One was a thinner, less resistive coating, and the other was a thicker, more resistive coating. And the thinner, less resistive coating works the best, uh, providing a higher productivity of the cells. Uh, facets of this project that I will be talking about today include the light source we use, the instrumentation that we have built for this project, and then the berry dye and electrolyte, which are the two variables that I pursued. The important point of a solar cell is to take energy from the sun and convert it into electrical energy. And to do that, it absorbs the radiation from the sun. This is a uh, solar spectrum of the radiation put off by the sun. And as you can see, it is a pretty smooth curve. It, uh, there's emission at almost every wavelength including the ultraviolet, visible, and infrared uh, spectrum. And so the light source that you use to test your cells, you should want to mimic the solar radiation as best as possible. So we found a plant grow lamp, and we were really excited. It was advertised as a broad spectrum wavelength lamp. We're like, great, this is awesome. We're going to use it to test our solar cells. Uh, we borrowed a red tide emission 
spectrophotometer from the physics department to test the radiation spectrum of the plant grow lamp and found not a smooth, broad spectrum wavelength of light omitted. So we hit the drawing boards, looked around at some light sources we had available to us on campus, and decided to use an old school projector. <laughs> when we tested it, we found a broad spectrum uh, wavelength, you know, wavelength emissions at most of the visible and trailing off into some ultraviolet and infrared on the tail ends. So from now on, we will be using the overhead projector as the light source to better mimic the sun so that the solar cells we're testing give us more reliable results. So some measurements that are really important for solar cell research are the short circuit current, the open circuit voltage, and the maximum power. These are three facets of the measurements that I'm currently able to take, and I'll be introducing you to each of these in a moment. And two measurements that we hope to be able to take in the future are fill factor and energy conversion efficiency. Fill factor is a ratio of the square area under the maximum power curve divided by the square area of the IV curve, which uh, maximum power curves and IV curves are two things that the instrument I'll be talking about produce. And so you take that ratio and that gives you your fill factor. And once you have fill factor and the other three measurements, you can calculate the conversion efficiency, which is the percent of the solar energy that is converted into usable electrical energy by the solar cell. So we realized that the method we were using to measure our cells was ineffective, because really you need to be able to take current and voltage readings simultaneously to get a better understanding of the solar cell's production capabilities. And we didn't have the instrumentation to do that. So we went to the literature and found a professor and a student who published a paper on how they built their own solar cell curve generator. And we decided that we really liked the idea. And so I spent uh, part of my summer and my entire first semester building a new instrument for the university. This is a representative curve of what the instrument will produce. It's called an IV or current voltage curve. And so where the curve crosses the y-axis is the short circuit current, and the short circuit current is the maximum current that can be produced by the cell under no load, so that's when the voltage is zero. Where the curve crosses the x-axis is the open circuit voltage. That is the maximum voltage that the cell can produce under no current uh, situations. Although these two numbers are really great, they actually don't tell us anything because when either variable is zero, you have no power produced, and so the cell is actually not effective. So the maximum power is the point on the curve where you get the highest number when you multiply the short circuit current and the uh, voltage together. And so that's the, the spot on your graph where your cell is producing at its maximum, and that's really where you want your solar cells to be working any time you're putting them to use. So to build this instrument, I had to start with a circuit design. And the important part of this circuit is what is called an operational amplifier, right here where this triangle is. There's a positive and a negative terminal on an operational amplifier, and it demands that the current coming into both sides is the same. So we use a data acquisition board to send a voltage into the pop, uh, use the data acquisition board to send a voltage across the resistor to turn it into a current and come into the operational amplifier, which is then hooked up into a feedback loop that the solar cell is inserted into, and the operational amplifier will demand that the solar cell produce the same amount of current that the DAC board is sending, and then it will measure the voltage that the solar cell is uh, providing to reach that current. To work, the cur to work the circuit, you need a computer program, so I use LabVIEW to code a computer program, and there are three main parts to this computer program. The first part, tells the data acquisition or DAC board to send the voltage to the circuit. And it does so in a series of iterations. Uh, typically we use 25 steps to get 25 data points. And at every step it increases the current that it, or increases the voltage it outputs to ask for a higher current. The second part of the instrument uh, computer design is built to uh, read the voltage through the solar cell at the current being produced. And then the third part, <coughs> excuse me, the third part of the computer program 
compiles it all into the current voltage curve that we can then see and look at to determine the results. Although the computer program is really great, you need a way to run it, so we created a user interface front panel where the user can input the number of steps or data points that they want, the maximum current that they want the uh, solar cell to be asked to produce for the operational amplifier, and we created a way to scale the graph depending on if you're using a prefabricated solar cell to test the instrument or a solar cell made in-house, so that way the, the graphs come out in, at a readable scale. This is what the instrument looks like when it is all set up. On the left, you have the overhead projector with the solar cell sitting on top of it. In the middle here, the, that is the circuit that I built and the data acquisition board that we use. Uh, we were working under the limit of detection of this data acquisition board, so we added a battery eliminator to boost the scene voltage by the computer, and then we subtracted it out later. I'd like to thank Sigma Zeta for the grant money that they gave me. They, with that money, I was able to buy the data acquisition board and the battery eliminator and thus complete this project. And here on the right, we have the computer that houses the program that runs the entire thing. So this is an IV and power curve that I was able to get with my uh, new instrument. This is a prefabricated silicon solar cell that we knew all the measurements taken from it. And so we were able to determine whether or not the instrument works as expected. Luckily, it does. And so again, you can see uh, on the y-axis where the graph crosses it is the short circuit current, which is covering just over 10 milliamps. Uh, here on the x-axis, you have the open circuit voltage, reading it just over half a volt. And then the red line is the maximum power curve. And uh, this was a figure taken from my honors thesis that I just submitted. Hence why it's figure number 38. <laughs> and so moving into the two types of dye that I tested, I tested blackberry dye and blueberry dye. And so these are the results I obtained. Both times it was an iodine electrolyte to keep everything the same except for the dye. Uh, the blackberry dye is on the left and the blueberry dye is on the right. And so luckily these curves look like they're supposed to, so we were really proud of that. And the important thing to note here is the data is actually inconclusive because oh, the maximum current, the short circuit current is the same for both and the open circuit voltages are really similar, so we can't decide, or we can't determine statistically which one is better or not, so more trials should be run in the future. The next variable I tested was the electrolyte. I used an iodine electrolyte commercially available and synthesized my own ferrocene electrolyte. Unfortunately, something went wrong with the ferrocene synthesis and the results are very inconclusive because we got a negative voltage being produced by the cell, which is not physically possible. So. Um, we have to hit the drawing board again to figure out uh, how to improve that ferrocene synthesis so that we are able to uh, retest these cells. And both of these cells were made with the blackberry dye to keep everything except the electrolyte the same. Some conclusions that can be drawn from my research are that I have increased the longevity and in increased the efficiency of the fabrication process of these solar cells. Uh, I built and improved an instrument and a methodology to test the solar cells, which was really great because before I got here and working on this instrument, our school was unable to simultaneously test the voltage and current through a solar cell, which meant that we couldn't compare to literature values. And with this new instrument, we are now able to better compare to literature values and future students will have that opportunity. Finally, I continued working towards increasing the efficiency by testing the dye and the electrolyte. And so, some future directions. We would like to see the instrument uh, go through a couple more test runs. We really need to work on the limit of detection. It's right at the uh, levels produced by our solar cell. And so we're having trouble sometimes determining whether or not our results are 100% accurate. So I'd like to see us be able to do that. And if we can increase that limit of detection, we will then be able to measure the fill factor and calculate the efficiency. And we'll then completely be able to compare results to literature values. Finally, the electrolyte synthesis needs to be uh, redone. We're not sure exactly why the synthesis failed, but we think it has to do with atmospheric, ox atmospheric oxygen uh, causing an oxidation reduction reaction to occur, and we did not uh, account
account for that, and so we will want to go back through that and see if we can do it under conditions with no atmospheric oxygen in it to uh, redo the synthesis. Finally, I would like to thank uh, my two research advisors, Dr. Neal and Dr. Cyrus Barnett from the Chemistry Department, as well as Dr. James Williams from our Honors College, who has provided some funding, as well as the Simmons Aiden Grant Fund, uh, for the opportunity to be able to build this instrument. I have the instrument minus the computer program up here with me. If you'd like to check it out after the talks and presentations later today, we have to talk about it. Any questions? You, you presented last year, correct? I did, sir. And there, you explained at that time, I think, the choice of the dyes, why, blue, why blueberry and blackberry? So, for a solar cell to work the best, you want it to be able to absorb wavelength, many different wavelengths. And it's thought that darker berry dyes, like, like blackberries, have the ability to absorb more wavelengths through the nature of the dye. Oh. It has to do with the difference in the ground state and the excited states. That the difference between those, the homo and the blue homo, equates to the wavelength that can be absorbed. And so because blackberry uh, dye is thought to have more of those energy differences, it can absorb more of the wavelengths. And then Blueberry dye was kind of our lighter dye that we used to test the theory of does the darkness of the dye actually matter? It, it appears so far that they are equal. Uh, can you go back and re-explain the relationship between the dye and the electrolyte? What's the connection between these two quantities? So basically where the dot how the dye and the electrolyte tie together in the big picture. You had you, yeah. had, you talked about this at the start and it zoomed past a wee bit too fast. So I think it was where you had your titanium dye. Yep, yeah, that one. Or okay, this one. Yeah. So the so the purpose of the dye and the purpose of the electrolyte in this are. Okay, so the dye is what actually absorbs the electron and allows it to be promoted to its excited state. The electrolyte kind of acts as the electron replenisher. So every time the dye loses an electron, it gains a charge, and you need to bring that charge back to zero. So the electrolyte donates an electron to the dye to bring it back to a neutral charge. So and what, then, yep, so that, okay, that's what I thought. So what's so sooner or later then you're gonna run out of electrolyte. If it's continuously giving away electrons. It, it is, but then the way that the circuit, you have a completed circuit, so the electron that the dye uh, lost in the first place goes through the circuit and comes back to the electrolyte and replenishes that the electrolyte. So theoretically, there is no lost electrolyte in the system. There's just a momentary time lapse that one of them is going to have a positive or negative charge. And there's no problems with the uh, iodide, triiodide degrading your dye or anything? There is some problem with degradation, and that is another facet that some scientists are working on, figuring out a way to create an electrolyte that doesn't degrade over time. Last question. Uh, how many times, when you showed the, the car, the, your results, how many mm -hmm. times did you run these? I ran each of my four trials five times, so I made five cells every time, and the graphs that I showed were representative graphs. And your reproducibility is good? Yes, yes sir. We had uh, most of our cells for each trial were producing at very similar results. Uh, we would like to run more trials in the future just to get a better uh, variety, a better range, so that we can then run statistical analysis on them, because five Trials is not I think that's something I asked you about last year was the dye to dye, the concentration of the pigments and the dyes. <laughs> I think it was. <laughs> you, you have some ideas about what you would do with the dye to We're not totally sure yet. Uh, one thought is that it's a problem with our circuit. And so we did, we talked to the physicists and engineers on campus. Uh, for some help, we think a big problem is the internal resistance of some of our electrical components in the system is too high because right now our solar cells are producing at such a low voltage and current that the uh, internal resistance of the, these chips are overtaking it. And so we're hoping in the future we can order lower resistance chips that would allow us to increase that limit. Do you have a, do you have a feel for how thick your nanoparticle coating is? Uh, we are not exactly sure. 
one student before me did a little bit of work with a scanning electron microscope on that, uh, but we're not totally sure. It's pretty thin, so when I make them, uh, I use a piece, four pieces of tape on the glass, and then I drop the uh, liquid suspended titanium dioxide nanoparticles, and then I use a razor blade to drag it across as thin as I can get it, and then let it dry, but I, I couldn't uh, quantify that. Thank you. How did the components of your cells? Oh. Are we? Okay. Go ahead. Thank you. Go ahead and finish your question, please. How did the components of your cells compare to commercial solar cells? Do you know if they have the same? Uh, so, <clears throat> currently on the market, the major solar cells you think of are going to be silicon solar cells. And so, right now, my solar cells don't compare to those because they're two completely different facets of solar cells. But we're hoping in the future these disensitized solar cells uh, will have greater efficiency, longer viability uh, to replace the silicon solar cells. So let's go ahead and